So we are here today with the wonderful Mercy Shibemba. Hello, thank you for having me. Hey, uh, it's great having you here. Absolutely fantastic. And um, we uh, wanted to pull in Mercy to chat about uh, an aspect of the fruit of the spirit, uh, goodness. Um, because uh, how long ago did we go and have that uh, that weekend together? With oh, the it others? seems like it was maybe two months ago. Two Something months like... ago, yeah. But we we had a great great time together, and um, uh, and it was kind of a first time really getting to hear your story. I'd heard you speak before at a youth conference, but it was my first time really getting to know you. And uh, I, I remember just being sat around in the baking heat. <laughs> It was a hot day like this. <laughs> and uh, just being blown away by um uh, kind of what's caught your heart and and how that is outworked in your in your life and how you are um how you are just living life in the spirit uh, doing that and it's just like yes fantastic we need to hear more of that so i'm really excited because we get to just hear uh, a bit about your story and all that kind of stuff but also how this Im- impacts um, and in our understanding with uh, this aspect of the fruit of the spirit. So I guess to begin with, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, Mercy, because uh, it's always good to get to know uh, know people and hear their stories. Yeah, so um, hi everyone, I'm Mercy. Uh, a lot of people will know my husband, Juana Shabemba, but yeah, my story is quite a unique one, I would say. So I, um, I grew up with HIV, so I've kind of, yeah, had had an interesting um I guess like time as a teenager trying to put piece together all that I'd known kind of growing up in a Christian home but also having this thing and really grappling with a lot of questions about well why why has this happened to me and you know Mm -hmm. is God really who I believe people have told me he is all of my life and um I always explain it there's a really good podcast I listened to once which talked about how people who've grown up I guess, as Christians, um, deal with big trauma. And the question isn't um, really, God, are you real? But actually, it's God, where were you? Because you know that God is, yeah, God is who he says he is. And so um, really trying to grapple with that. And yeah, thank you to an amazing church family and incredible youth leaders that actually I'm, you know, still serving him and his kingdom. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, kind of growing up, I got involved with an organization called Chiva, and they like support children and young people living with HIV in the UK. And yeah, just being involved with them, I guess, showed me that actually this was something that God could use for good. And that actually um, he's given me words to speak and people to meet that actually I can use and um, live live a life that, you know, still sees the goodness of the Lord, um, even in this tough situation. And so, um, yeah, kind of gone on a big, big journey with that. But at the moment, I do a range of things. So um, I work on clinical trials and research, supporting young people um, from around the world to kind of influence the structures and systems of um, pediatric research. Because I think that if you're impacted by something, you should be able to be involved in being the driving seat. Um, And then I also work um, on a funding program in the UK, which is a 10 million pound 10-year commitment um, to support black children and young people and this really started off the back of what happened in 2020 with what I call kind of the delayed recognition of racial inequality Mm -hmm. Um, it's something that I've experienced all of my life and has happened for you know kind of all of time um, for lots of different people Um, and so those are the two kind of main things and I'm also a non-executive director and do a range of other projects so I like to keep busy um, (laughs) I'm grateful you're not busy with all that (laughs) stuff surely (laughs) no no of course not yeah I think I'm just grateful for the capacity that God has given me and um, that I'm able and um, have been released to do um yeah a range of different things and in the midst of all that you've um you got married in the last two years in the last three years in yeah. the last three years as well so um uh in uh i guess you're, you're no longer in that newlywed phase are you but still uh oh you moved house recently didn't you we did we bought our first house in oldham the... um, which Juana would very much say is the place that god lives yeah so. <laughs> <laughs> excited to have our roots here if we could um just kind of unpack some of those um things just to uh help people really understand i guess um because it's not everybody's experience uh, to grow up with hiv um 
Uh, what impact did that have on you growing up? What was that like? Were you, um, yeah, just to pretend that we we don't know what yeah. what is at stake here? Yeah, so thankfully, because of medicine, um, growing up uh, and living with HIV is quite, I guess, simple in in a sense. So I've got a normal life expectancy. Um, I can't pass it on to Wana or our future children. Um, I take medicine once a day. I go to the hospital kind of twice a year for a checkup. So in that sense, it's quite a simple thing. But actually, what was major and is still major about it is more the societal impact. So stigma um, is still a massive thing. A lot of people are still, um, yeah, still kind of thinking in the mindset of, you know, perhaps the 80s and 90s and the information that would have been available then. I don't think that um, the current science is necessary, necessarily cut through. And so really it was grappling with a can I still do everything that I wanted to do? I've always been a very determined person and I've always, I'm always one of those people who's like, if I want to do something, I probably did it three days ago. And so <laughs> like, ah, like, will, will this, will this ruin the plans that I had for my life? When I was around like 10, I did a life plan until I was 40. So I've, I, I was like, you know, this, this was not in the plan. Okay. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I guess really just trying to figure out like how comfortable am I with being different? How comfortable am I with the fact that I am living with a condition that a lot of people will um, will cause, you know, some people to turn away from me. Mm. And I think that's really helped me ground myself in knowing like who I am, who God's made me to be um, and turn me into someone who's yeah now kind of really confident and able to kind of hold my own. But at the time I was really yeah, quite insecure and not really um, confident and secure in who I was, who God said I am and yeah. the life that I would be able to live. So um, did you find that you, as a, you said you were diagnosed at 10, as 10? No, so I, that was, 10 was when I made my big old life plan, but I was diagnosed okay. as a baby. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. And have you, have you found that um, when friends and other people have found out that you are HIV positive, that, that there have been some people that have just gone, I don't want to have anything to do with you because I'm scared of maybe catching it or, or whatever it is. Yeah, of course there's been, you know, the odd kind of relationship loss or the occasion, you know, occasional comment that actually is like, yeah, probably we're not we're not suited to be on the same path together. Um, but in in yeah, in all of it, I think people have generally been um really compassionate and really open to learning and trying to yeah, I guess understand how this impacts me, but also how they can help and support me. Yeah. And one of the things I guess that yeah, the whole experience has taught me is to not shy away from having those difficult conversations. And I think yeah, um one of the things that I've I often talk about is a lot of the time um people assume that people in church have been worse about it than like people in the general population um but actually in all of the church congregations I've been part of so I grew up in All Nations Church Cardiff I went to university in Leicester so I was part of the Big Shed Covenant Life Church um and now I'm in All Nations Church Oldham and all three of those church families have never never not supported me, never not loved me. And I think, yeah, that's something that I'm always really keen to put across because I know that's not everybody's experience, but actually I think it's really important that people know that the church is compassionate and it is, you know, the loving, yeah, the it's, it's the physical love of Jesus here, you know, with, with us. And I think that, um, yeah, if I have a chance to speak well of the body that I'm a part of, like... <laughs> That's uh, that's always great to hear. So you said that you got involved with, uh, or I say you got involved, but uh, an organisation called Chiva um, came yeah. and supported you. What what kind of impact did that have on you? Not just in terms of helping you in terms of your well being um, in that particular moment, but in terms of how you wanted to. Well, did it affect your thirty year plan, so to speak, and the kind of person that you wanted to be? And, yeah, absolutely. So um, when I got involved with them was the first time I ever met another young person living with HIV. And I think just meeting somebody else and being like, 
oh my gosh, they totally understand me. They know kind of what I've been through. I don't have to explain anything to them. Made me feel like I wasn't alone. I grew up in Cardiff where I think at the time there were only like 20 people in the whole of Wales um, who were children growing up with HIV. So wow. a really small number in comparison to other kind of big cities in England. Um, and actually at that, um, so we've gone on a residential weekend and I met um, two other um kind of girls who were a bit older than me and one of them had done the university degree that I wanted to do and you know one of them was kind of so I, it was really a good um I guess lesson to me to say actually no I can do it because I've I've now met others who are like me who are achieving their dreams so yeah absolutely and how did um you talked about uh being insecure um there's the the hiv stuff and the racial inequality stuff that that's been going on what what came and helped you um come to this place of being secure in your identity of um of uh, how to say you know the this is this is me so to speak um but yeah go on i'll let you talk rather than me carry on <laughs> rambling the question yeah. <laughs> That's a really good question. I think for me, the realization that God made me, like really understanding that, I think is what, yeah, what unlocked that for me because ultimately God, like God is so good and he's, you know, all of like the amazing things. And if he, yeah, chose to make me and has like planted me where I am, then how can I not be secure in that? Yeah. Um, and I think, just yeah just that simple um knowing that actually I wasn't yeah I like nothing about me is sort of by accident but actually God has created me to be who I am and so like how can I not be firm in that and I think yeah knowing that you have yeah a heavenly father and you know the holy spirit and and all of this backing you and that you're you know I've been planted in incredible church families is like yeah, how how could I not take advantage of that and run with that as far as I can? And the, I mean, we all have our ups and downs and all that kind of stuff in the in the daily um, and just what life brings. Um, was this? Um, did did you find more security in your identity? Was this before university? Was this kind of during university? Has this been afterwards? What's the kind of timeline? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I would say going to university and moving to Leicester was a massive part of that. So one of the things um, that young people growing up with HIV often talk about is that it in that, in that scenario, it's not just about you, it's kind of a family thing. Okay. Um, and so, and even I think for most kids who've grown up in church, you're sort of looked at as like your parent's child, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. And so going to university was the first time that I feel I owned, I owned my story in a sense that, you know, I got to pick which hospital I went to for my treatment, where I was going to get my medicine. But I also got to pick, you know, what church was I going to be a part of and, you know, what, what was I going to do? And I think that really, yeah, that was transformational, uh, trans. Yeah, I, I think I said that right. Yeah, you did. You did. Uh, for me. And, um, you know, uh, obviously, um, I was part of Covenant Life Church Leicester. Um, and Brian and Hazel Shutt were a huge, a huge part of that for me. They've, they've sown so much into me. And, yeah, we spent so much time together, where, whether it was, you know, over meals or, you know, just serving, serving in the life of the church, but actually just really seeing me as my own person and who I was and calling out, you know, the giftings that God has put on me, but also releasing me into, you know, the several bits and of things that I was doing. You know, I, I think um, I went on quite a few international trips when I was part of the church there and Brian was always like, I'd always know exactly where you are and, you know, we're always praying for you. And I think it's just, yeah, I, I think there's nothing greater than um, being secure and having freedom, but also having not parameters that might be that might have the wrong con connotations but there's your there's like a um I guess being under authority and being part of something and I think society often now you know everybody will know is very much like I can I'm an island and I can do whatever I want however I want and all of that but actually for me I've yeah found the greatest freedom in being within within someone's authority but also like there's massive freedom in that and I think 
that really helped me to find my own identity and who who I am in Christ. Yeah, it's the it's the the kind of football pitch lines and the rules that are in play that allow you to go off and enjoy yourself in that kind of setting. But I guess you know, there's the you're no longer Mercy, the child that's grown up and has been cute, and you know, isn't she great? And how, look how she's developed in youth. But you go you go into Leicester and you go into that community, and it's like, wow, this is Mercy. And uh, this is all the stuff that she's got to give. And this is what we can give to help her grow into um, this woman of potential. And you just like uh, uh, in in finding that place, it's just quite good, isn't it? I guess uh, uh, breaking out and being able to be totally you as an adult, as a responsible person without uh, and not not that baggage is a bad thing, but there is a there's an element of that, isn't there? So. Um, I can I can well see <laughs> how that was a transformation. And you know, you you're no longer living off your parents' spirituality. You're not living off your youth leaders. You you've got to make that decision for yourself. And because you you could you could walk, you could go and do whatever you want. You could choose not to get up on a Sunday morning or get involved in the life of the church. But you you make a choice, and uh, it's in those moments where you go, "This is real for me." <laughs> not that it wasn't real before, but. Excellent. And so at, at university, you got involved in some um, some activism work or did you get involved before uni? Yeah, so I got involved before uni, yeah, through the stuff that I did with Chiva, but all quite anonymously. So obviously we've already talked about stigma and one of the things was that, um, you know, this wasn't something that I was open about in a public sense, um, a few kind of select people new uh but going to university and yeah kind of really owning my story made me feel a bit like actually maybe this is something that I would want to share more widely than I have yeah um, and then yeah whilst I was at university um I received uh, an award um and part of that was I guess that was a big part of my journey to say actually I'm just gonna be public about this and you know open about it and um that was a really yeah that's been a huge part of yeah the last kind of however many years of my life and it was a decision that I yeah I think I always knew I wanted to make but wasn't exactly sure of when I would make it but it's yeah it's something that I'm grateful that God yeah God provided the opportunity what was the reward for what? So um, there's a, a, the award is the Diana's Legacy Award. So there's a charity that was set up um, after the death of Princess Diana. Um, and it was, yeah, it's basically to, yeah, honour young people who are continuing her legacy. So um, it had been 20 years in 2017 since her death. Um, so there was, yeah, a new award in her name, which was the Diana's Legacy Award. Um, and it was given to me by Prince Harry and Prince William. So it was one of those things where it was like, I could do this and, yeah, be public about the fact that this is because I've been doing work based on my experience of growing up with HIV. Um, or it was offered to me that I could do it privately and kind of continue to still, um, yeah, kind of have that separation of only a few people know. Um, but actually, I think... Yeah, I, I've I, I really wanted that opportunity. You know, God, God had really kind of opened the door, and I remember at the time, yeah, calling so many of you know my friends in you know the Cardiff Church, and you know speaking to people at Covenant Life, and just saying like, you know, it's not exactly like there's a Bible verse which is like, <laughs> you should do this. I mean, you know, in some sense there is, but I yeah was really I've never been more grateful to have. Um, yeah prophetic prophetic ministry and people who you know are um actively listening and walking in the ways of the holy spirit to actually be able to support me in like making that decision yeah yeah and there's uh <laughs> there's always a tension with making those kinds of decisions because ultimately you just want to you want to obey god don't you and do do the right thing but you also have and i guess this is part of where the whole goodness thing falls in because there's a there's an inner I, I don't know uh, Paul describes it in Romans 8 doesn't he is like this groaning yeah for something more and when you when you see that there are people that are um hurting when you see that there's a change that needs to be made there's this inner desire to to see something happen and what's more is in this particular kind of 
realm um where you've you've been a part of you have power to be able to do something but it's making sure that it's done in the right way uh, at the right time and and all that kind of stuff so just talk to us a little bit about um uh if you can i get i guess just that inner um in a, that inner feeling that inner sense of injustice mm -hmm. maybe uh, at what's taking place and um just how that that kind of outworked in that moment at university I guess over the, those kind of three years as you were really starting to um, go for it in terms of being public and, and letting people know about how this affects people in, in the wider world. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm an older sister, so I've never struggled to see injustice because I'm usually always complaining that <laughs> my sister's getting away with something. So, sorry, I'm not sure if you could hear that a big sound. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think... God has given me, yeah, a passion to see justice lived out. And obviously my name is Mercy. So I've I've grown up with that kind of, not hanging over me, but have been reminded at times <laughs> um, to, you know, show God's mercy and be more merciful. And I think for me, I, yeah, was always sort of confused as to why I was going to have to live a life that was, yeah, full of shame about something that actually is a manageable health condition um and yeah ultimately I knew that from the work that I had done and um the people that I had met that actually I had something to say God had given me yeah God had given me a gift to be able to use and ultimately like shame wasn't something that I was happy with stopping that and yeah. um I think yeah often um your your greatest challenge can be the thing that God you know uses to show you know his his goodness and there's been so many situations where actually I've been able to see his kingdom come in rooms that like would never possibly have seen that and um one of the things obviously with HIV is you know um part of the stigma um is because of the I guess the communities it affects and so um, you know, one of those communities, um, you know, is the LGBT community. Um, and, you know, I grew up in a very Christian home in a very sheltered kind of, um, and I don't think sheltered in the wrong way, but that that was just my, my experience, a very, you know, average four person family Christian yeah. childhood. Um, and so to go into situations where actually I was met with a world that I've been, you know, very far away from and never really interacted with, but actually, um still having that sense of injustice because every person is um yeah god wants everybody to be in his kingdom right and so um it was suddenly like i was in in these situations where i was like i would never have interacted with the person in front of me if mm -hmm. i if i didn't have this condition and if i didn't do this thing and actually now that i'm here and in this room with this person i can show the love of god to them and in and for a lot of that community they don't want anything to do with the church and you know with christianity and so yeah it's been i think that's been a massive part of the journey um but also just you know in the scriptures and um you know seeing in the life of jesus that actually jesus hated injustice and so mm -hmm that's what that's what we're called to do as well and um whether that's to do with um the work i do on hiv and global health um or racial inequality um or anything else i think yeah having that passionate desire to see um his kingdom come and his, his holiness rule in situations where actually something's happening that isn't quite right mm. um and ultimately god's given us the ability to know that, to yearn for that, but also to put that into motion. Oh, excellent, excellent. Could we uh, just talk about the the racial inequality stuff as well? Because the the um, I mean, it's just great that you <laughs> you're involved in these different different areas because there's there's just such a big need for it. But I think the um, the the racial inequality stuff will be in a lot of people's minds, particularly with what happened over the kind of COVID pandemic and the the Black Lives Matter movement and 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 how that kind of swept through the western world in particular um how how did you get involved in the the racial inequality activism what how did how did that process start for you before we kind of yeah. get to where you're at now 
Yeah, good question. I would say, yeah, before 2020, I think um, it probably shown up in bits and pieces of my life. Um, obviously, I'm black and have always been, will always be. So it's always something that I've had to think about as I navigate the world, particularly growing up in the West. Um, but really, yeah, I guess it just been, racism was always just this thing where it's like, everybody knows it happens, um, but that's just life. So you just, you just have to get on with it. Um, and so, yeah. Just, I remember... just uh, if, uh, sorry, I don't know if you're just about to do it, but just to give some examples of what, what that's like, um, the, I mean, the church community here are predominantly white and we're quite reflective of the, the town that we're in, which is more white than China is Chinese. <laughs> um, and so a lot of people just won't really understand what that means. What, how, how does that look? Um, yeah. So just share some examples of... If, so if... I moved to the UK when I was five um, and we'd moved from Spain. So I only spoke Spanish um, and had to kind of, yeah, quickly learn English. So um, what I remember from, I guess, early childhood was just, you know, a lot of situations where children would perhaps call me the N-word or they would say that I don't, I don't play, my like my parents have told me I don't play with black children um those sorts of things um and then yeah kind of have some really uh like yeah strong memories of you know moments in high school I remember um so English was always my favorite subject um and I did English at uni and I remember being in English class um and I'd given an answer to the teacher um and also because it was my favorite subject I just loved I was kind of like probably the kid in class who would have given the teacher an apple when it came to English lessons. Um, but I remember this one day I put my hand up and I'd given this answer and the teacher just sort of said, great, thank you. Um, and this kid behind me, I'll never forget this, says, oh, pretty smart for a black girl. And just the laughter that kind of rumbled behind me um, and just like nothing from the teacher. So wow. there, there have been a lot of situations where I guess, yeah, growing up, I saw very individual scenarios, but then also working on this fund has shown me, um, you know, when kind of looking at research that actually across the board in terms of um, institutions that, you know, black children and young people don't do as well on mass, whereas actually in other countries in the world, they do a lot better or, you know, um, just seeing that kind of play out, not just on an individual level, but on a on a systems level. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, obviously, um, Wana is also black. So I think for us, um, particularly 2020, it was yeah, kind of in our first year of marriage. And I, I remember waking up um, and seeing the George Floyd incident kind of go viral and it's interesting because there'd been so many others. And yeah. so it was always something that it would be like, oh, did you see, did you see that thing? Um, and just sort of, yeah, not, not necessarily not caring, but also being like, it happens so often that you have to develop, develop a resilience and almost a numbness to be able to kind of continue about your day. The cynicism um, kind of thing. Yeah, mm. exactly. Um, but this was, yeah, this was just really different because it just kept going. Like it was like, okay, it's gone viral. Oh, we're still, it's still being talked about. And then I think, yeah, of course, just kind of blew up into this thing where actually for the first time we were starting to have these major conversations um, about what does it mean to be black, you know, kind of around the world, but for us here at home, what does it mean to be black in the UK? And so, um, I remember those days, um, obviously Ezekiel um, leads, you know, All Nations Church Oldham, and he did a really good series um, on, yeah, let's talk about race. Um, and, you know, we'd, we'd gone to them, obviously, as my parents-in-law, but also as, you know, leaders and others who are Black and just sort of sat with them and, you know, talked for a long time about our experiences, both in the church that have been racist, in the circles that mm -hmm. we're in, but also in life. And, and really just, um, yeah, trying to, I guess, find ways to to deal with that and understand what comes next, because I think there'd always been the reality for us that the world we live in is racist, um, but there hadn't necessarily been the, okay, but what if we could actually do something about mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, for us as a couple that looked different, so um, 
we yeah we had a couple of conversations with friends um both kind of within the church and outside of the church just saying you know this is this is what we've experienced this is you know this is how we felt for a long time and yeah. um this is yeah i guess how you can support us and be praying for us and um thinking about other people's experiences and <clears throat> yeah, i'm really grateful for yeah the various conversations that we were able to have but also um i think what hurt me the most was um i think in a sense we're quite lucky and blessed because we were able to go to ezekiel and mahongo and just say this is how we feel and you know but actually there are so many people that i spoke to who have missed the gospel because of racism yeah okay that that is that that's what cut me so deep so um we had um yeah, kind of a, a, a midweek meeting on Zoom, as many of us were having. Um, and I remember uh, a woman in our church who um, is black and, you know, she's she's absolutely wonderful. And she she talked about how her experiences um, had led her to um, to doubt, actually, what God's word said about her. Oh, wow. And that that for me is why it's so important that we talk about it and we stamp it out because it's not it like it's just not okay that mm-hmm. we can have people among us in our church body who can read a psalm and say i don't know if that's the truth about who god yeah. says i am because <clears throat> i have not been treated this way by my brothers and sisters and i think that you know, often people can think, oh, racism is just this thing that happens every now and then. And it's, you know, like a nasty comment here and there. But actually, for a lot of us, it's happening, you know, quite a lot of the time. Um, and in ways that, you know, kind of continue to chip away. And unless we're talking about it and dealing with it and praying, you know, then we're just, we're kind of letting these things happen and not understanding that they're knocking the foundational stuff for people, the foundational truth that is, you know, you are who God says you are and you know um racism shouldn't play a part in that but for some people it's going to um and so that yeah that in a nutshell I guess is yeah why I'm so passionate about making sure that racial inequality doesn't continue um and where it does that actually we call it out and we put measures in place to say that this shouldn't this shouldn't happen and you know um do i think i'm gonna you know solve racism probably not but actually god's given me a position to steward 10 million pounds to support people who are dealing with the effects of that and i think that in itself will create an impact and um i've been really grateful for the support and yeah i guess the wisdom and guidance of god and you know to be able to steward that faithfully um and do something that i think will bring about change Oh, fantastic. And the, the, I mean, there, there's just so much stuff in all of what you've just said there, Mercy, you can really see how um, this is just something that is, is captured you and indeed is something that, that really needs to captivate the church. You know, we were at um, Brian Schutt's um, celebration uh, just this Monday, gone. Um, if you're listening sometime in the future, it's uh, in August <coughs> 2022. But um, uh, one of the things that was said about him was that he was he was a voice for the people that had no voice. Mm. And um, there's a there's a need for the church to stand up in in matters, of, particularly of racial inequality and and all of these other areas where there are vulnerable people that just don't have a voice. And this is one key aspect of of coming in and, and showing God's goodness in that sense of wanting justice and the righteous anger and all of that kind of stuff to see change take place and i think you know it, you have uh, when you were sharing about your hiv stuff um before about how it affected the way that you think of yourself and that um just questioning um how god could make you and 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 you not be quite right and all that kind of stuff and to think that there there's there's people out there that think that full stop is is a crime but to think that there are a whole community of people that could think about them think about themselves like that based on the color of their skin is is just 
unbelievable. And there's this this need to uh, re-educate a community of people that might still be believing in antiquated scientific. And um, if you're listening to this, I'm using the finger <laughs> quotations, the antiquated scientific studies of the inferiority of of black people or other races or uh, or other things like that. Um, I think it's it's important as well just for people to understand that, that systemic racism doesn't necessarily look like the overt racism that many people will think of. You know, the I remember looking at um I think it was that it was the last census information and just seeing that I, I think it is it eleven percent of the population in the UK are black. I believe it, so. I'm not the census data is being released this year, isn't it? So I'm not 100 percent sure where we're. Lying. Yeah. So when I when I looked at it was it would have been 10 years ago because they they take it every 10 years. Um, 10 years ago, I think it was either seven percent or 11 percent. I can't quite remember. But the prison population rate for black people was like 45 percent. And you're just thinking to to see something like that take place, where there is not a reflection of the what's taking place in community and society it, to such an extent and it, it doesn't absolve people of the the, the crime that they've committed but it, it, it certainly is an indictment on the society that allows people to remain in a situation where I, oh, yeah. mercy. I, I just remember my mind being blown when you start yeah. actually unpacking how how the systemic stuff works you just like you don't realize at all exactly and, and i think for me, one of the one of the things that really came out of that year in twenty, you know, twenty twenty, and unpacking, yeah, I guess what what has it meant to be black, but also understanding people's, I guess, mistrust of churches and Christianity yeah. because of colonialism and slavery and how all of that was really um, wrongly wrapped up in scripture um and people's teachings yeah. um that completely subverted what the gospel actually means and um i think that's one of the things that people don't necessarily carry that history of um you know i think we assume that kind of the bible has always been taught in its full sense but actually for so many people for generations it will have been weaponized against them yeah. rather than an invitation um to be part of yeah, the kingdom of God. And I think that's been a big thing that I've been trying to, yeah, get people to realize that actually this is, this is a big, big complex situation. And it isn't something that I guess just arrived in, in 2020. No, no, absolutely not. So um, what, what kind of things are you involved in, in the grants, um, the grant body, what kind of projects are you looking to get involved with and what, what difference will they make? Yeah, so I, um, yeah, I've been kind of co-leading um, and really that looked like in the early days, just figuring out, okay, we've got 10 million pounds. How, how do we want to spend it? What do we want to focus on? And really going on a journey. So myself and my colleague um, who's based down in London, you know, having very different experiences of growing up being black, but also really similar ones. So Part of what we did was, sorry, just give me a second. <clears throat> in the early days, um, look at a lot of research, do a lot of reading, um, really understand, I guess, across the UK, what mm. does it look like? And then from there, um, we decided we wanted to focus our first year on supporting black children and young people to create the change they want to see in the world. So um, I think one thing that we've definitely seen about the current generation of young people whether that's gen z gen alpha whoever it is um that actually i think yeah having having a voice is something that's obviously like a really important mm. thing, i think for everybody but i think we see it particularly in the young people of today um and whether that's through kind of the protests that we saw in 2020 which you know weren't just around black lives matter but also climate change and other mm huge issues and so um what we've done and what we're in the process of doing is putting a million pounds towards supporting um black children young people across the uk um with money to resource the ideas that they want to see positive change mm. in their community it's something that i'm really passionate about that i've done with um you know my own story of kind of growing up with hiv and i'm really 
excited to be able to resource that for people. But also one of the things has been that a lot of organizations and charities that support um you know communities that need support are often underfunded often don't have access to resource i think anybody who's ever filled in a grant application will know that you know it is it's a long journey and not always a, a fair one it's not always just and it's not always on the side of the people who are creating the change so mm. um whilst a lot of a lot of what I've done has been around supporting black children, young people, actually it's really opened my eyes to see um, the inequalities that exist in this system of philanthropy and distributing wealth and actually what that should look like um, and how we, yeah, how those who've been entrusted with, you know, wealth, you know, like my portfolio or people who have big personal wealth um, that actually you're supposed to steward, steward it really wisely um and yeah just supporting people to do the right thing with their money and support others to be able to access it easily and not make it a a too long a process yeah oh, fantastic it's I, I just think it's incredible that you're in such a position of influence and to have 10 million pounds kind of at your not at your personal disposal but being able to resource people in in such great ways and i i love the first one because the first thing that you were saying about uh, equipping um young black people to go off and and do their ideas that's not just about um fixing racial inequality but that's just equipping them to go off and and change the world so to speak i just i love the breadth of the vision with that i think it's it's absolutely fantastic so great job there um i, I just wonder because uh, you've obviously been in the face of um uh, injustice uh, up close up close and personal in your in your own life but as also you've been talking with people and having discussions and all that kind of stuff and I'm sure that you will have felt the the righteous anger rise up in you um how, how does that work um I'm just trying to think of the right way to phrase it but um there's a point when righteous anger turns into a, an aggression and a, an aggressive anger which to, to some degrees, not just in the Black Lives Matter, but in a lot of protests where there is a just cause, but there's something that switches and it and it moves into something that then becomes wrong in a sense. Mm. How how do we temper that? How do we how do we talk about that? How do we, like in our own lives, um, make sure that we we monitor that righteous anger in a really um healthy way? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, it does. And it's a good question because I think as much as I love my career in a sense and what God's put in front of me, it makes me really angry and it makes me really sad <laughs> yeah. um, to see so much injustice play out again and again. And I've definitely been caught in those moments where I'm like, oh, maybe I, sh I shouldn't have said this in this no. way because actually I was just being angry and I wasn't supporting people. So I think my, yeah, my first advice would be to make sure that you have um I guess yeah accountability in place around you so um I've been yeah really grateful for those who've yeah kept me on the right track in terms of you know sometimes I've got a speech that I'm doing and I'm, I, I'll go to somebody with it and say does this yeah okay does this, does this speak of the heart you know that I have you know to to communicate um but also I think having spaces where you can be angry and I think as Christians, we sometimes aren't very good at that because we're always like, oh, you've got to be joyful all the time. <laughs> yeah. um, but actually, sometimes you are really sad and sometimes you are really angry. And I think it's about knowing that God has given you emotions, um, but he's also given you the capacity to steward them. Um, and so, you know, just really practical steps. If I am feeling really angry about something, I just walk and I pray and I just say, do you know what? Um, you know, there's my team know when when not to bother me because I'll just say I'm I'm gonna take the next hour out for a walk um and one is like you go for a walk okay <laughs> <laughs> and you know but I come back and I'm refreshed and I'm ready to speak in you know a mature and healthy okay. way and I think um sometimes we don't say this because it sounds really basic but actually just speaking speaking to God is a great way to be yeah. able to to find that balance um and also i think um that yeah that feeling of the bubbling up of 
you know, really righteous anger in you um, can also be a good thing because it can mm. indicate in situations. Um, there's been times where I've been caught off guard, I think, by how how annoyed something's made me feel. But actually, um, it's because of something that I hadn't necessarily um, hadn't necessarily clicked into. And then I've been like, oh, no, there's something wrong here. Um, because I don't feel at peace when I'm, you know, in this situation or thinking about, you know, whatever we might be planning. And I think it's also not just to discount it and kind of pray it away, but actually to say, God, what's what's leading me to feel this way? Yeah. Um, and what are you showing me about this thing? Um, but also, yeah, what have you put in my hands for me to be able to change the situation? And I think... Um, yeah, it is really um, easy as well to, I guess, comment on the anger that is out there in the world. But I think not holding people to the standards, especially if they're not Christians and, uh, you know, we don't, they're not necessarily living by the standards that we yeah. we would live to. Um, but also, you know, there's a quote, um, I can never remember who said it, but a, a lot of people say a riot is the language of the unheard. Mm. And actually often past that, you know, what shows up to you as anger has been a legacy of not being listened to, of being passed over. And um, I think, yeah, for me, rather than dismissing people because they're angry, it's about trying to get under the surface and understand yeah. what has led them to show up in this way. Um, because often it's hurt. From yeah. something and it might be something that you think oh it's not really valid but actually there's something in there for that person that means they they feel they've had to show up this way and yeah. um, I think one of the yeah obviously you know um you've all been thinking about the fruits of the spirit and I think part of part of I know we're talking about goodness but patience to really mm. sit with people um and listen to them and you know, especially in situations where I've been like, I don't understand your world, I don't understand your context, but actually, now that I've listened to you, I understand why God's put me here, and I, you know, God will give you the words to say that can, um, yeah, that can calm people down and that can bring them actually comfort and everlasting peace, not just a wishy-washy kind of um cute cute, cute quote that will help them see through that day but actually um something that they can go back to and continually mull over yeah. um, because yeah God, god's given us um his words and um the holy spirit is always working um you know through us but in people um and so to not discount actually that your yeah your presence in somebody's really angry day um can support them to have less of those angry days yeah absolutely i it, i mean i just uh love that heart behind uh behind what you're saying I, I, the whole taking that time out to listen to people you just can't you can't underestimate how important there is that there's that famous phrase isn't there that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care and uh and and you know you read through the old testament don't you when when god is passing judgment on on israel and he says you know i know that you're not carrying my my heart for people because you're not looking out for the the vulnerable people for the orphan for the widow for the foreigner and for the for the poor and needy and for him that's like the litmus test of of whether you're following him <laughs> or not and you know that that heart and attitudes it it comes forward to today doesn't it and you know i work in student ministry and when um people come and ask about the suffering in the world and what god's doing about it and you just say well he's raised you and me yeah. to go and to deal with that and if we don't carry that compassionate heart if we don't have this sense of wanting to see something just take place here and to correct all of the inequalities and to to do our part in seeing that take place then then we are not fulfilling our our role as being the hands and feet of jesus yeah. um and you know the <clears throat> trying to help people come into that place of restoration and renewal of they are the image of christ they are and, and and if we can help people come into that place where they recognize that they are created in the image of god and that they they are valued and they do have worth and there is purpose and there is plan and and all of that kind of stuff then then if we just do that for one person 
you know the the effect that we can have is is just dramatic but i think it's important for people to understand that whole that though that what was that phrase that you said about the riot the riot is the oh, unheard uh, people. the right as the language of the unheard yeah you know just that that recognizing that though there is something wrong that is taking place that actually there is this whole layer of stuff underneath and you know you're not just talking days and weeks of stuff but generations upon generations of of injustice and it, it just it rises up in in a moment and and things like that happen and it's the <clears throat> yeah we need the wisdom of god <laughs> in those moments to to deal with it as as best as possible yeah how um what encouragement would you give to anybody that's listening or watching um in how they can kind of tap into um this aspect of the fruit of the spirit how they can grow in it um how they can channel it um yeah what what would you just speak to that yeah so one of the things that i um i always think about when i think of the goodness of the lord is obviously um that song that's been really popular over the past couple of years about the goodness mm. of god and it's it's running after you and i think um often we don't realize i guess how yeah how the goodness of god can show up in our lives and so what one thing i would say is to be particularly watchful of what how that fruit looks in your own life um because i think you'll often be surprised about how how that shows up for you so um yeah be alert is one thing that i would say um but then i the other thing i would say is one of the things we've been talking about as a church body is that um you've been made to be fruitful mm -hmm. um and so um to see you know any of the fruits of the gifts isn't it's not something that God has created that's an unattainable thing for you, but actually um, that you just living in line and step with um, the Holy Spirit means that you can, yeah, you can see those fruits evident in your own life. And so um, for me, I, I love, um, I think it's in Psalm 27, um, the, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living and to really hold on to that promise and the the verse that comes after that is um wait for is wait for the lord and it's about being strong and taking heart and i think so often we can feel like um and i feel this way as well because i'm often too busy we can feel like ah we've got a race to do all of these things but actually just waiting on god um is the biggest piece of advice i would have to, for seeing the fruits of the spirit and particularly goodness showing up and then in a practical sense just pay, pay attention to um the things that god puts on your heart and the things that he's given you in your hands to be able to see that goodness come to fruition so um yeah i think my my main thing is be prepared to be caught off guard um i've just come back from a, a trip actually and um i was extremely tired one evening and kind of had a text from um a colleague to say oh could you know come out and you know hang out whatever um and I remember seeing and I was like oh but I'm so so tired um but I I just had a sense that this person needed just needed somebody to sit with mm. um and you know kind of later you know a, a few kind of um days later it transpired that you know their other plans had been something um really that they didn't want to do that I I would not do and I would not advise other people to do but actually if I hadn't gone and met them in that circumstance even in my tiredness and even in my oh I, I couldn't be bothered um they would have been caught up in something that wasn't yeah. good for them ultimately and I think yeah so often for me those have been where the greatest testimonies have been not where I've planned that oh I'm going to do this great amazing thing but actually where I've been willing to be caught off guard and use just yeah the the time and the giftings that god has given me to say okay i'm willing to be inconvenienced um and i'll see i'll see what god does and that might just look like sitting with somebody for a coffee on an evening or it might look like you know giving them an amazing word of knowledge but whatever that looks like yeah i would just say yeah to be to be alert in all that you do fantastic well thank you so much mercy you've been uh outstanding it's been fantastic just hearing your heart and hearing how you've uh 
uh, just taken on this call from God to, to go and change the world. And our prayer is that um, that you will play your part in that to the fullest capacity that you can possibly do. And in the whole time, just knowing the, the close fellowship of the Spirit in, in all of that, that's uh, just incredible. So thank you so much. And we'll see you again next time.